We are delighted to bring you this seminar presented by Labroot. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining today's keynote presentation titled Pattern Evidence Reconstruction. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker today, Dr. Henry Lee, a Kai professor, University of New Haven Chief Emeritus, Connecticut State Police Director and of the Research and Training Center. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the tab button at the top of your screen. If you have any questions that arise during the presentation, we encourage you to submit your answers, I mean, I'm sorry, your questions in the Q&A box. Our speaker will address your questions following the presentation. As a reminder, this presentation is educational and offers free continuing education credits. Click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right corner of your presentation window and follow the process to obtain those credits. Please join me now in welcoming our keynote presenter, Dr. Henry Lee. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Welcome, sir. Uh, good morning, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about pattern as evidence. As you probably know, the criminal investigation at the crime scene, forensic scientist, police officer, detective, will often go through the central dogma of a, a forensic examination. Forensic science is a little bit different than a uh, other scientific fields such as chemistry, biology, molecular biology, immunology, or even medicine. We separate our work in three stages. The first stage called scene processing. Scene processing star recognition. We'll have to recognize the potential evidence. Not everything at the crime scene is physical evidence. So recognition is the first step. Once you recognize this potential evidence, you have to document, preserve, and collect. The next stage is laboratory process. Those collected physical evidence is submitted to the laboratory. We through identification, comparison, and with instrumental, biological, physical, other type of uh, examination, comparison, and individualize that particular evidence. From there, the third stage of uh, is court processing. We have to transmit our report with the documentation to the court of the law, either through the prosecution prosecutor or the defense the defense attorney into the court. Once the evidence introduced the court will have to testify. And we not only testify our result, but also make interpretation and reconstruction. Physical evidence come from all different forms. There are so many different ways to classify the physical evidence. I generally put into the following seven categories. Transit evidence, which means something can change quickly. Pattern evidence is what we're going to address today. Then conditional evidence, transfer evidence, associative evidence, uh, electronic evidence, and medical evidence. Last lecture, we already covered all those, but today we're going to talk about pattern evidence. What we're going to do today, we're going to talk about what is pattern evidence? How is it involved? in crime scene. What type of pattern evidence can be found at the crime scene? And where to find it? How to find it? How is it collected? 
how it should be handled and preserved, how is it examined, and uh, what's the evidential value of those pattern evidence in investigation. And the last, we're going to cover pattern evidence reconstruction. What is evidence, pattern evidence? There are so many books, paper published, give all different meanings, definitions, procedures. Pattern evidence generally created from different objects when they have a physical contact with a surface to surface and leave behind some imprint impression, indentation. Evidence, pattern evidence can be visible or latent. May find a variety type of object and surface. There are guidelines from NIST and OSEC. So the examination of those physical evidence should follow the national guidelines. What is crime scene reconstruction? The crime scene reconstruction is the scientific analysis of crime, the crime scene, using pattern evidence, logic, physical evidence, the result of testing, laboratory testing, to test a hypothesis about what did happen, how did it happen, what did happen, what the sequence back at the crime scene. Crime scene reconstruction, usually we need the following. Laboratory result of physical evidence, scientific analysis and observation of the crime scene, recognition and interpretation of the pattern evidence at the scene, and systematic study of any other related information uh, utilize the big data, develop a logic hypothesis. Then we use scientific results to test those hypotheses. And here we come with a viable theory. That's called crime scene reconstruction. Here is an example. I was called to the scene at the known time. Initially, it looks like a traffic accident. However, the crime scene pattern indicates it's inconsistent with a typical traffic accident. A car, vehicle in the middle of the parkway Victim's body found next to the vehicle with his pants down. Of course, that's against the common sense. How many drivers drive a car with pants down? In addition, we notice victim was shot twice behind the head. There are two bullet holes found the windshield. With all those patterns indicate to us, this vehicle probably have three occupants. The victim more likely is sitting in a front driver's seat. The shooter is from the behind in the back seat based on the trajectory. So just look at the pattern. We already developed a hypothesis. It's more likely it's a homicide. It's not a uh, traffic accident. Two suspect, more likely in the woods, are left the scene already. So with that, we start look at it. The pattern evidence, usually 
where can we find those? Impression made in soft material or a surface, such as soil, sand, snow at the sea. Indentation or damage made by force onto a surface. Imprint made by dirt, dust, soil, deposit on a flat, flat and hard surface. Impression made by object with the dust or wet, wax, greasy surface. Imprint made by transfer of blood, body fluid, ink, or grease like a material, a ink like material. For example, an outdoor crime scene, a investigator, some step on a soil surface, some step on a concrete surface, other on the grass, each of them left some imprint, impression, or indentation. Another example, the breaking robbery case, we look at the glass, the fragment, and uh, fracture mark that tell us the direction of the force, the type of material used to break the window. This is a vehicle involving a crime left behind the scene. So on the surface of the vehicle, as you can see, different type of mark, the roof, all those are pattern evidence. We use a laser light source, try to examine those patterns. Pattern evidence can also found on the other piece of physical evidence. For example, this is a plastic bag, but on the bag, we can see fingerprint, we can see folding mark, we see writing, all kind of a, those are form of pattern evidence. This is a homicide scene. Of course, we can see blood pattern, handprints, and of course, the damage pattern on the wall. So pattern evidence actually consists so many different categories, such as fingerprint, handprint, glove, sock spring. I just want to give you some example. If a year no spring, by marks, handwriting, wounds, a injury, blood pattern, fabric pattern, body condition, MO pattern, Medusa Branda, uh, this means method of operation, and a voice spring, fire burn pattern, tire track marks, tool mark, cutting mark, machine mark, weapon, bullet casing. GSR pattern, trajectory pattern, even instrumental data, for example, GC chart, mass spec chart, those are pattern too. Stamp type, all those are patterns. Those patterns, some were familiar ways, such as fingerprint, striation mark on the bullet, tire mark at the scene, or a blur stamp pattern. Some of the pattern which we use for identification. For example, a fingerprint, we want to compare the fingerprint known records to identify the individual left the fingerprint. The bullet striking mark, we want to associate to certain type of weapon, tire mark, same thing. Blur pattern, besides identify the source of the blood. In addition, we can see this blood still 
not complete dry. It's semi-coagulate. That give up indication how long those will be shaped. Those are pattern for reconstruction. For example, this lock was on top of the blood, which means after blood deposit, this lock was broken. So with that in mind, pattern identification, for example, handwritings, palm prints, fingerprints, cutting mark, we can identify the type of a cutting instrument. With a mass spec or uh, even DNA, that's also a pattern recognition. We recognize the pattern. Those pattern is for individualization to identify certain drugs, certain body fluid, or a individual uh, DNA. But there are some marks, patterns, we use for interpretation. We know those are sharp instrument left as a major mark. Uh, we can make interpretation, the direction of those mark was making, and uh, whether or not made by another individual or by the victim, him or herself. Even a college uh, test exam, we can look at a exam paper to determine the erasure and uh, look at a the marking, whether or not made by the same pencil or by same individual, those marking and uh, erasure. Of course, those are just interpretation. You cannot really trace to the source of origin. In between, this is pattern reconstruction. For example, a fire, when I got there, I noticed there are five origins. Dark red, those indicates probably 700 to 900 Fahrenheit. Cherry red, the temperature indicates about 1100 to 1300 Fahrenheit. Yellowish cherry red is hotter, about 14 to 1500. Uh, yellow, uh, which even higher now, bright yellow, that's probably got to 2100 Fahrenheit. So from the pattern, we can recognize different origin, different temperature, that's a suspicious fire. Through the burn pattern, we can also make interpretation the, the direction of the fire, melting objects, what type of temperature uh, can reach at the fire scene, those objects melting. Left behind, the shoe print can tell us how many people and uh, what the direction. Here, another example of a homicide scene. The blood pattern, the deposit of the towel, and uh, the blood floating pattern, and no blood at the west, um, west basket, um, blood smear on the countertop. Each of those give us some information about this crime scene. So where? and how to find a pattern evidence. Obviously, at the crime scene. Crime scene can be as huge as the whole airport or a whole house. Can be as small as a piece of hair, 
or fingernail, you may pollen particles. So how and where we can find the evidence? Before we talk about how to find the evidence, we want to know something called linkage theory. In late 18th century, we all know something called Lacar's transfer theory. Lacar is a well-known forensic scientist. He come up with a theory when two objects in contact, they have a mutual transfer between the border. The linkage theory is slightly different. It built on Lacar's theory of transfer. We have to consider the victim, the evidence, and the crime scene, and suspect the four-way linkage transfer. Victim can leave the evidence at the scene, and also suspect contact the victim can have a mutual exchange of the material. Also, we have to consider so-called secondary transfer. Even no direct contact may have transferred too. So once we know this linkage theory, so where to find it, that's become elementary. Of course, at the crime scene, the point of entry, point of exit, pass to target area, to target, to target area, we can find pattern evidence or physical evidence, such as object, closing, tools, locks, door, window, safe. We can find a body. Later, I will give you some example on somebody, victim's hand, suspect's hand. For example, gun shell residue pattern on a suspect's hand can tell us the individual may discharge or handle or touch a firearm. The distribution of the gunshot residue on victim's body, we can determine, estimate the distance between a barrel to the target area. So at the crime scene, we look for pattern evidence, point of entry. That's the area usually leaves some evidence uh, how we found it? Generally, if the pattern is visible, that's much easier. But many times, the pattern evidence is not so visible. We have to use lighting, dark the room, use side lighting, helping us to look for pattern evidence. Sometimes we have to use chemical filming technique. For example, a vehicle. We know more likely a person enter the vehicle may touch the frame area. So we try to search those area for pattern evidence. Once you recognize, identify those pattern evidence at the scene, we have to protect those evidence, generally cover the area, avoid contamination or step on it. Otherwise, the case is going to have difficulty. For example, the famous O.J. Simpson case. DNA born at the scene. Scientifically, no doubt in my mind, I review those DNA results from Los Angeles Police Department, Department of Justice, and uh, other laboratory, DNA laboratory testing. So when I testify, I say the DNA, in fact, is contributed and, uh, by 
O.J. Simpson. Except the evidence was collected, item 48, 50, 52, uh, June 13, they co uh, June 12, they collect, June 13, dry overnight, June 14, they start sampling, did the serological test, then DNA extraction, DNA testing. However, when we examine the evidence, I noticed their pattern evidence, so-called blood imprint on the packet, which means something have to transfer those patterns. Even today, we still don't know how those patterns get them there. Another example, two drop of liquid was found on a walkway. DNA is OJ Simpson's. However, one drop is complete dry, why is wet. If two drops would deposit at the same time, same day, same temperature, same environment, from the same person, same receiving at surface, that two drop should be the same. But have pattern tell us different. Of course, injury pattern, shoe print pattern, the button near broken. This pattern, those pattern indicates a struggle and uh, those are some defense wounds. So pattern evidence play an important role in the outcome of the case. How to find it? Basically, we follow a systematic and logic examination of the scene. We darken the area, use a strong side lighting light sources, search the area with oblique lighting. We enhance the suspect pattern with variety of scientific method. Later, we're going to cover that. So at the scene, the first thing we have to recognize, this is a triple homicide scene we found casing. The casing ejection pattern, PME indication, the shooter's location. The casing also tell us itself that fire from semi-automatic weapon. The shoe print, the stuff left behind each of those patterns yield information. So at the scene, the investigator and forensic scientists, we have to recognize and understand the importance of evidence, especially the location of those evidence, the pattern, the condition, we have to document thoroughly. So crime scene investigation, not just pick up the evidence, put in the evidence bag. We have to photograph, document those pattern evidence. We generally start with an overall view. Then we should photograph the evidence with scale, then take close-up photograph. We also have to take measurement, sketch, and documentation. Uh, we should follow the guideline. Documentation, generally, with an overall view, then move to a closer uh, specific area, then we photograph with scale. Once we finish the initial documentation, then we have to look at uh, the close-up and uh, document 
those imprint evidence, we say implant, uh, use different photographic technique, can be direct lighting, reflect lighting, bounce light or side lighting. Uh, this can be covered in a different lecture. So crime scene photograph, as I indicated before, start with the overall view, then we interview in media, then close up, and photo with scale, then evidence photo. Always have to do the sketch, sketch and notes and videotaping. Enhancement of the pattern can be photographic method, use oblique lighting, UV light, alternative light source, then use powder dusting or chemical reaging or a combination uh, with a newer procedure, we can also do image enhancement. That's an example of side lighting, UV lighting. Now have so many different light sources we can use at the crime scene can helping us discover those patterns and uh, document those patterns. A hit and run case vehicle. When we examine the vehicle, we notice some damage on the headlight area. But very important is this area, we found a fabric pattern. That's victim's pants. So although we cannot say definitively from that pants, but that gives us the similar wave pattern, similar measurement that could have resolved from the victim's pants. This case happened in uh, New York, um, Nassau County, a homicide detective come to our institute, took a course uh, of uh, pattern reconstruction. When he back to his department, he was called to the scene, a attempt rape case. That's a female college suspect apparently entered a, a shower room through the window. That's a shower stall. A victim fought the suspect and chased the suspect away from the scene. Uh, detective Wing used the alternative light source uh, was able to discover this shoe bring that pattern. From that, he was able to link one of the worker, work in a college and solve the case. With the initial photograph, visible light, very difficult to see the pattern. With the side lighting, uh, UV enhancement, then you can discover that. There's so many different enhancement reagents. Review of the literature, there are more than 20 commonly used chemical reagent we can use at the scene to enhance. Generally, we fall into the following, in those reagents falling into the following seven category, powder dusting, chemical reagent, can react with him. Uh, him is a monitor of the hemoglobin, which in the human blood or animal blood, any blood source, you can use that. Or protein enhancement reagent, body fluid enhancement reagent, vegetative material, 
on chemical, elemental, enhancement reagent. Here, an example, use powder dusting. We develop this pattern evidence. Blood enhancement reagent, such as orsotolidine, phenocyline, tetramethylbenzidine, local malachi green, luminol, fluorescein. <coughs> Those are some commonly used. Orsotolidine, because that's potential carcinogenic, um, should not use. which we can enhance. When you select the reagent, basically you want the best contrast. Look at the substrata, the receiving surface. Uh, try to find a maximum contrast so you can document those. This case is a homicide case happening in Ohio. And a suspect left a, a partial shoe print on uh, a sheet, which not really visible. However, after we use chemical enhancement, we can see the sneaker, the uh, uh, Chevron pattern. Also, you can use fluorescence chemical to enhance. Another major category is use protein enhancement reagent from colors reagent react with amino acid or protein become a color compound. Commonly used reagent are ninhydrin, amino black, crystal violet, DFO, chromatic blue, and ninhydrin analog. For example, this is a case I call to the scene and uh, we was able to develop a pattern on the victim's body. Subsequently, through the body, we was able to reconstruct the scene and solve the case. Now, after you develop, you recognize what you're going to do with those pattern evidence. Of course, first to photograph, document, do all the measurement at the scene. The next thing, try to lift or cast or dust and collect. If the area, you can move that piece of evidence, preferable is move the complete piece of evidence sent to the laboratory to exam, such as a broken glass or window or closing uh, floorboard. You have a certain uh, surface you cannot physically move, then you maybe cut the piece and uh, to submit to the laboratory. So basically, that's the four different way, photograph, documentation, collect the item, remove the object, cut the surface, waste the imprint. So it depends on the situation. Then we make a decision what to do. Of course, there are certain special lifting technique, such as use genitin lifter, use electronic, uh, electron static lifter, or gel mold casting, uh, different material. Now, once you lift the evidence or cut the evidence or submit the evidence, how you preserve a handle? Of course, you have to handle with care. You don't want to destroy the pattern. You don't want to remove or clean the modify or change the pattern. You have to place the suspect item create that pattern in a separate uh, box instead of mixed together. Also, you should package separately, carefully, 
And uh, nothing more important is document thoroughly before you do any lifting or cutting. Uh, so documentation, photographing is very important. Now we covered recognition of pattern, identification, document enhancement, collection. Once the patterns send to the lab, generally laboratory examiner will look at the pattern. Is this a two-dimensional, three-dimensional? Is that visible, latent? What's the direct char uh, class characteristics? What's the individual characteristic? If leave in a flat surface, generally we say that's a two-dimensional. You start with not visible after we enhance, become a visible piece of evidence. In addition, we also notice their sequence, two type of a pattern deposit on top of other. At the scene, you can also find three-dimensional evidence. Uh, you should photograph, document, and make a casting. Don't put your, your tool directly into the imprint, impression area to try to fit that. That going to cause the contamination. So pattern evidence Doesn't matter imprint or impression, it can be deposited by human, such as fingerprint, footprint, lip print, ear print, handwriting, can be an animal or vehicle, clothing, I should have a G here, and uh, objects, such as toe mark, bullet, typewriting pattern. Even on human body, we often find pattern evidence. I'm sure you probably have an idea what kind of pattern. Um, I'm sure most of you think that cigarette burn. Actually, you look at the size and uh, pattern, not actually a cigarette burn. Anybody have any idea what kind of pattern? Later you can ask me if you don't know. The next one, the next one, of course, that's a buy mark. Buy mark before you do anything, you should photograph and a document and collect saliva and DNA evidence. Imprint reconstruction, often you can find out a vehicle. For example, this vehicle, we can find static transfer evidence. It shows the seat have some kind of a material was put there, left this pattern. Here is another pattern. That can give us some idea what's there. Some are difficult to identify. Others are pretty easy. For example, this one, everybody can tell me, that's a hammer. Uh, many times, hit the run case, for example, this case happened in Taiwan. Uh, this is a suspected around vehicle. On the vehicle, there are some pattern here. Of course, very difficult to read it, but after enhancement, we can easily tell that's a three, that's a five, that's a seven, O, V, T, and uh, that's from a victim's license plate. 
We also sometimes at the scene will find so-called dynamic contact pattern, which indicates certain force was involved. For example, this tool mark shows us the direction of the force. For example, this blue pattern and medium velocity blood cast pattern can give us information. What type of a weapon, what type of direction, the shoe print, the movement, the contact, all of those are example of dynamic force. So what is the evidence value for pattern evidence in investigation? Obviously, you can link an object or vehicle to the pattern. You can link a person to the pattern evidence to the scene. You can confirm or refute a statement. You can link a person, a vehicle, or weapon, or any object to a case. You can help to reconstruct the crime scene. You can develop the investigative lead. For example, the blue pattern found a suspect's clothing uh, held us this individual was involved in the blood shedding case. His statement to police say he did not know anything. So obviously the pattern tell us otherwise. The blood pattern shows us this is a bare footprint. Uh, indicates the individual walk on the concrete surface, did not wear shoes. This is an indentation, uh, show us a work boots, the brand name of the work boots. Anybody have any idea what's the brand name of the work boots? Of course, this is one of my uh, uh, best case. Here, you have a homicide case. This is the vehicle. Of course, everybody can see a key and a key ring, which indicative something happened given the distribution of these two objects, indicate to us is separate from a key ring, that's more likely it's a door key. However, when we examine the car seat, that's the key, that's the key ring. But I'm sure some of you see here have a pattern. That's the pattern, which indicative the key was initially was here. Somebody sit on the seat and uh, the key adhere to the pants, deposit to here. And this is the original location. So pattern evidence can really helping us to reconstruct. For example, this is a, another uh, Connecticut tragedy, uh, a truck hit the police officer and took off at the highway I-84. Uh, the investigators stopped all the vehicle. I was called to the scene. This is a one of the vehicle stopped the truck. Under 160, we see a pattern. Usually hit the run case, we look for blood, hair, tissue, fabric, but this area did not find a blood, hair, tissue, and fabric. Under side lighting, we see this pattern, but not visible. Use chemical filming. We side lighting, we develop a trooper's shoulder patch. That's the victim's 
Sure. So with a single piece of pattern evidence, we was able to link the suspected vehicle to the victim and determine the sequence event and reconstruct the case. So general principle in physical pattern comparison, after we recognize and identify, so we can do a direct physical match, or we can include it, or similar or consistent with, or we can exclude, or we can reach a, cannot reach a conclusion insufficient detail or we call inconclusive or we can exclude some pattern or dissimilar. So again, this interpretation and the report, you should follow the guideline and uh, should meet the core test. This is the suspect's hues. And uh, that's the piece of evidence, the sneaker print on a piece type of the paper. Obviously, we say we exclude that. It's not the suspect sneaker left this pattern. That's just easy. Identification, we can say that's similar pattern. However, is this from that shoes? Unless we have significant individual characteristics and uh, very difficult to call. So matching is a term very difficult to use. Is this a match? Uh, of course, the striation, the inclusion, the mark, it shows that could find the same origin. Except now, of course, sometimes require statistical information, error rate, uh, many type of pattern evidence we cannot produce. Uh, for example, that trooper's shoulder patch found on the truck. In my whole career, we only have one case. I cannot really say statistically how likely that will produce. Reconstruction is the ultimate goal for pattern evidence. Re so at the crime scene, if we can reconstruct, that can give the investigator a lot of investigative lead and volume. What type of reconstruction we can do with that pattern evidence? We can look at a location of the pattern. We can look at the condition of the evidence, amount of evidence, distribution of the evidence, the sequence, whether or not those con are contaminated or altered, we can identify, we can interpret it. For example, we can determine how many tire track. Uh, obviously, we can see two. This is on top of this. And uh, so you know two different vehicles left them. There are also some other patterns. So at the scene, those patterns, we can study, uh, provide investigator some valuable clue. For example, the vehicle made a turn, the direction, and uh, of course, if the pattern has sufficient individual and the class characteristic, then you can link the object. Many times, the pattern evidence can help us to eliminate certain thing or to include certain individuals. This 
there's a case happening in Hawaii um, for uh, college students on spring break. Somehow, the vehicle, as you can see, left the mark, lost the control uh, on the clip, caused a fire, and uh, four body was commingled. Victim was identified through dental chart and DNA. That's the easy part. However, later become a major litigation, who is the driver? Uh, this is one of the victim's shoes. Underneath of the shoes, as you can see the pattern. Uh, that's the break mark. So we know this individual have a contact with this break, left this mark. Often at the scene, we also can tell how many people. For example, this scene, we see two types of shoe print. So tell us at least two individuals were involved. Also, the pattern can give us indication what the size of the shoes, uh, what's the possible height, what's the possible brand name of the shoes. This case, victim's body was found on the kitchen floor. Of course, the blue smear pattern indicates us the crazy Assaulter, which suggests the suspect tried to clean up the scene. The blood pattern evidence predominate on the top of the her garment, and uh, which indicative she was on the ground. Them stabbing occurred. Uh, there are also some uh, blood smear, blood imprint. We was able to. And hence, at the scene, not give us the partial shoe print. That's a close up for the shoe print. And uh, of course, through the data analysis, we was able to identify the type of shoes, and subsequently, the investigator was able to link the suspect, not only from the pattern evidence, also the trace evidence, uh, the blood stem, DNA on suspect shoes, and the pattern evidence, of course, that's the area enhanced, that's the ink print. That's the suspect's use. So basically, use pattern evidence, link the case, and uh, use DNA, and uh, link the suspect. We can do your bank reconstruction. For example, this is another crime scene. We have a tremendous blood uh, at the scene, victim's body, of course, the drawer open, and Nobler inside the drawer can tell us quite a bit of information. Um, on downstairs kitchen floor, we found some pattern. After enhanced, we know suspect uh, wear a work boots and uh, walk around the scene. Was sub subsequently the case was solved. This case happened in Florida. And uh, at the scene, we see some footprint from the uh, pattern. We can determine the person's stride, also the person more likely male, female, walking or running. Uh, those are the pattern interpretation. 
but in between have a blood which indicative uh, have some blood source make of those very, very vertical deposit uh, some pattern at the scene broken pieces of material and uh, also large of the amount of blood that is no center so-called growth spray uh, those material give us information more likely somebody cough on the blood and uh, we was able to reconstruct and uh, of course uh, they gave me a nickname call me king of the crime scene now time is up the last test that's a pattern this case the victim was a college student reported to police she was sexual assault by her former boyfriend not only sexual assault her also carved a heart in the palm of her head the boyfriend was arrested and uh, the boyfriend said no i did not do that i did not sexual saw her i did not cough the her uh she is crazy about me she want me to marry her i refuse she did herself this pattern helped us to look at a both person's statement, which one is more likely true. Okay, so with that, I turn uh, uh, put into Susie. We finish today's lecture. Let's start with our first great question coming in. We have some wonderful questions coming in from our audience members. Dr. Lee, for how long is evidence preserved? How long evidence preserved? That's two different uh, uh, answer. One is at the legal stand, each court, state, or federal case. For example, homicide evidence should preserve forever. Many uh, cases early days, for example, uh, sexual saw only five years, statute of limitation. Now they extend it longer, then you have to preserve longer. Scientifically, in the laboratory, when the police submit to the laboratory, if under laboratory custody, laboratory have to preserve uh, in that period of time and tear release to the submitting agencies. Thank you for that. And how do you establish the identity of the person in um, a sexual offense with help of the asthma peria, um, permia semen? Okay. Uh, in other words, the question is, if somebody doesn't have sperm, all right, uh, their ejaculation has no sperm. However, they still have cells, body cells, mm -hmm. in their seminal fluid. So you still can find DNA. In addition, you can find protein markers. You can always do protein markers, plus recover some cells to do PCR, to enhance STR, and do DNA analysis. Thank you very much. When new shoes are made, is a pattern of the bottom supplied to the database somewhere voluntarily? I wondered uh, about this as well. <laughs> good question. Good question. Yeah. On uh, early days, you know, I already retired five times, so I don't collect shoe prints. <laughs> early days, my career, we collect shoe prints. 
and uh, we write into the manufacturer, ask for uh, you give us a uh, exemplar. We goes to shoe store uh, to look at the pattern. Uh, Susie, to tell you, uh, early days, I don't remember my wife's birthday, <laughs> but I do remember the pattern. After seeing, I can look at the pattern, I say, aha, that's Puma sneaker. And uh, of course, today have they big database. A lot of commercial uh, company, they uh, have this database available. A lot of laboratory and different country all have database. So hopefully someday, I don't know, maybe they already exist, have a world big database so everybody can use that. That would be great, huh? Dr. Lee, what was the pattern on slide 85? Slide 85. Okay, I have to <laughs> look at uh, this pair of May it waste me a second. I have to look at a slide 85. I think, uh, 85 Sunaga. I believe it was the one that you said, ask me leader. It had the two marks, uh, those small marks that we uh, misinterpreted as cigarette burns. Uh, and you that's, said, ask me later. Uh, yes. That's 84. This is 85. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, that's a good question. What kind of mark? Uh, oh, and it looks like we may have lost Dr. Lee for a second. Um, I'm sure that he will be right back. <clears throat> We apologize for that. Sometimes we have these little moments of errors in technology. I'm sure this happens all over the world, and each of you have experienced this in the past. So we all apologize. Right. Okay. Here he is. Okay. This is a sucking mark. It's not the teeth mm. mark. It's a mouse. Contact the surface. Interesting. Yeah, very interesting and, mark. And thank you for that. And again, audience members, thank you for your great questions coming in. Dr. Lee, what is the most common manipulation of evidence that forensics would encounter? Can you ask again, what's the most common? What is the most common manipulation of evidence that you forensics mean? would encounter? You mean somebody else manipulate the evidence or? I believe that's, yes, I believe that's what they're asking. Okay, most of the time people try to edit some more uh, or try to remove, for example, mm -hmm. cleaning, washing, uh, destroy the evidence. Many times they threw in some curveball. For example, we do have a case somebody wear somebody else's shoes, left some uh, shoe print at the scene. Or, uh, of course, uh, many times they put the different people's clothing and uh, trace evidence at the scene. Thank you for that. And Dr. Lee, how do you process latent fingerprints on concrete surface? That's the first part of the question. And which method is most useful for developing latent um, fingerprint finger marks on such surfaces? Uh, what surfaces? Second portion. On the concrete surfaces. Okay, concrete surfaces depends on the concrete. Uh, if a rough surface, you cannot find a readable fingerprint, usable fingerprint. Maybe we can use chemical, develop uh, the size of the hand or size of the finger, make some interpretation. Uh, if a smooth surface, generally we can use fingerprint powder or use cyanide acrylic filming to develop 
the pattern. Thank you for that. And how many evidences are presented in court before a crime is proven, like a homicide, for uh -huh. example? Okay. Uh, excellent. Oh, those questions are excellent. You know, Aren't they great? Uh, uh, those are great questions. This is also a question should not ask a forensic scientist because people think the movie and uh, television mm -hmm. show think the forensic scientists we start from the crime scene, we work in the lab, we go to court, we're dictating the outcome, how many pieces present. But forensic scientists actually in a legal setting were not like the movies. Most of forensic scientists doesn't go to the scene. I'm the few exception. The crimes are usually handled by detective or major crime squad or crime scene technicians. Um, when goes to court, not say we want to say what we want to say, what to present. Usually the lawyers, the district attorney decide what to present, what the sequence to present. What question they ask you? If you are a defense expert, you call to the court. Uh, they just present one or two pieces in favor of the defendant. They only ask a few questions. Nobody want the whole picture, whole story. Uh, the forensic scientist, we just like a piece of a music instrument in the corner depends the musician and the conductor decide. The conductor basically is the judge. So uh, a lot of uh, uh, media coverage criticized the forensic scientists were not scientific enough. We don't know what we're doing. But if you look at it carefully, it's not up to the forensic scientists. Just like a, we don't live like a, uh, uh, those movie uh, CSI, we don't drive pampers, we don't eat in a fancy restaurant, we work around the clock. Lucky we have a hamburger. Good questions. <laughs> Great questions. And we have quite a few questions, and I want to remind our audience that any questions we can't answer today, we will be answering via email. Dr. Lee, are you up for a couple more? I think uh, we're already over time, okay? How about uh, one more uh, question then? I'll tell you one last question, okay. I'll, I'll ask you this one. I know you won't be able to have time to talk about it, but what was the hardest case you've had to solve? Uh, that's basically case without information. In other words, we're not called to the scene, nor the physical evidence will collect. You are basically one person's statement versus another statement. You don't have any other direct physical evidence. Those are difficult to solve. I can give you a lot of example, but some other time when we maybe future to have a uh, serious unsolvable homicide or something. Okay, I want to again thank you Susan, thank you Taylor, Lane, and uh, Lepro, the most importantly thank you all, all those uh, audience, thank you for uh, listen to my talk and uh, I wish you all stay safe, healthy, and uh, when you go out, make sure put the mask on, okay? Uh, <laughs> now I have to leave, so I put my mask on now. Thank you again. Dr. Lee. Bye. Dr. Dr. Lee, thank you again, and thank you for the audience for your wonderful questions today. As a final reminder, 
Any questions that were not submitted will be provided via email. This presentation will be available on demand viewing until November 2020. So please share it with your colleagues who may have missed today's topic. Thank you again for your participation. And until next time, be safe and stay healthy. Bye-bye.